This is the interior of the rotunda in the U.S. Capitol building, one of the most iconic places of American democracy. A few days ago, on January 6th, 2021, one of the darkest moments in recent the recent history of this democracy occurred here when hundreds of right-wing extremists, incited by President Trump's appalling words and behavior, broke into the Capitol and engaged in a riot that left five people dead. The country and the world has been talking about little else since. This video is not specifically about the Capitol insurrection, but rather an attempt to give it some historical context. Some of the terrorists who rioted here on Wednesday were apparently under the impression that they were the vanguard of a quote-unquote revolution, and some of the terrorists presented themselves with iconography and symbols that drew deliberate parallels to the American Revolution. In addition to all the many other things they got wrong, such as basic facts, these deranged people also managed to get history wrong. What they were advocating for was a coup, not a revolution. There's a difference, and it matters. So what is the difference between a coup and a revolution, and why does it matter? That's what this video is about. Hello, I'm Sean Munger. I'm a historian. I'm also an author, podcaster, and teacher. My website is at seanmunger.com. I do free webinars now and again on various historical topics. I have history courses online. My podcasts are called Second Decade. That's a historical show and Green Screen, which is the environmental movie podcast. The incitement to violence and insurrection that occurred on Wednesday is shocking and indefensible. As horrified as we all are by what happened, it's worth trying to put this event in historical context and understand what happened and how it was like and unlike other major events in history. By any measure, revolutions are big events in history. If I can be forgiven for using the term turning points, that does apply to revolutions. Even people who don't know that much about revolutions can usually name a few major ones. The American Revolution of 1776, the French Revolution of 1789, Russian Revolution 1917, and the Chinese Revolution, which began in 1911, but took about 40 years to run its course. Due to the convergence of a series of revolutions, near and near revolutions, in the last decades of the 18th and first decades of the 19th century, some historians, notably Eric Hobsbawm, have even named that whole time the Age of Revolutions. Coups, however, are a little different. We tend to associate coups with countries that are viewed as unstable or undemocratic. Most of us are aware that coups, usually by military leaders, have occurred often in Latin American countries and sometimes the Middle East. Augusto Pinochet of Chile is an example of a leader who came to power in a coup. So was Muammar Gaddafi of Libya. Coups may resemble revolutions in one highly visible way. They both involve a change of political leadership on a national level. But aside from that similarity, in fact, the phenomenon are quite different from one another. Simply put, the difference is this. Coups involve a change of leaders. Revolutions involve a change of systems. To explain what I mean by that, let's look at some historical examples. In 1789, there was a major political and social upheaval in France. Animated by the ideas of the Enlightenment, and particularly the American Revolution, to which it was related in many ways, the people of France rose up against the monarchy of the Bourbon dynasty and the king Louis XVI. There was an extended period of political chaos within France, which eventually spilled outside its borders in the form of wars between France and its neighbors, what happened in France between 1789, the storming of the Bastille, and 1799, the takeover of power by Napoleon, was undoubtedly a revolution. We could spend weeks talking about the reasons why this event happened. But what's obvious is that France underwent a fundamental transformation of its entire society, not just from the top down, but at all levels. Yes, the king and eventually the queen got their heads chopped off, but the taxation system also changed, the legal system changed, the people who decided cases and built roads and ran the schools, they all changed. For a while, even the calendar changed. That was how transformative the French Revolution was. Let's contrast that with what happened in Libya nearly 200 years later. In 1969, Libya was a monarchy ruled by King Idris I. 
Formerly one of the poorest countries in North Africa, Libya achieved economic prosperity very suddenly after the discovery of oil there in 1959. The king made sure that the revenues from the oil flowed to a very small group concentrated at the top. On September 1, 1969, a group of military officers, led by Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, used military force to surround the key government buildings and media establishments. They overthrew the king and took over the government for themselves. Notably, there were no casualties suffered in this event. Gaddafi was motivated by the ideology of pan-Arabism, which was championed by the Egyptian leader Abdel Nasser, who also came to power in a coup. At first, these events, Libya in 1969 and France 1789, might look superficially similar. Both were changes of government. Both abolished a monarchy and established ostensibly, in the case of Libya, a republic in its place. Gaddafi, in fact, tried to spin what happened in Libya in 1969 as a revolution, but this was largely just public relations. Libya remained a dictatorship under Gaddafi's control until he was overthrown by a revolution, not a coup, in 2011. Yet it's easy to see the difference between the French Revolution and the Libyan coup. The events in Libya in 1969 were a change of leadership from the top down. The end of the Idris regime wouldn't have happened if Gaddafi and his toadies hadn't plotted to overthrow the government. By contrast, the monarchy in France by the late 1780s was almost guaranteed to crumble from one proximate cause or another. And the causes of the monarchy's decay were primarily economic and social, not political. Admittedly, in some cases, the lines between coup and revolution can be a bit fuzzy, but I chose these examples because they're very stark illustrations of the dynamics of each one. Now, back to the capital rioters. It's abundantly clear that a revolution is not what these people wanted, or even thought that they wanted. They were motivated by a single, rather narrow goal, to keep President Donald Trump in power, despite the results of a free, fair, and legitimate election that went against him in November. There was no program in the wind for large-scale societal or systemic change. What these people demanded was that a particular leader be installed to the exclusion of another one that they didn't like. That is a coup. It's not a revolution. Historically speaking, fealty to a particular political leader is never the driving force behind a revolution. The American Revolution didn't happen because people thought they wanted George Washington rather than King George III as their leader. In a true revolution, the specific person who occupies the leadership being overthrown is generally not important or sometimes totally irrelevant. Almost nobody can remember the name of the dynastic ruler who was overthrown in China's 1911 revolution. His name was Puyi, for the record. And despite their hatred of the abuses of the French monarchy, King Louis XVI was actually pretty well liked by many people in France before their revolution in 1789. Puyi and Louis happened to be sitting in the chair when the revolutions happened, but the revolutions did not have a lot to do with them personally. Typically, leaders of overthrown governments have public rage in a revolutionary society focused upon them, such as the Shah of Iran did in 1979. But the driving force behind the Iranian revolution was rage at the system the Shah and his dynasty represented, not so much the Shah himself. That's an important distinction. Revolutions also tend to be led by a revolutionary elite. Sometimes the members of this elite spend the bulk of their lives clawing their way into positions of dominance and figuring out how to use their power. Lenin in Russia, Sun Yat-sen and Mao Zedong in China, and the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran all spent most of their lives building the revolutions that brought them to power. The elite of the American Revolution, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, George Washington, and so forth, they all had to do a fair amount of career building before the revolution got started. The revolutionary elite is different from what you might call a cabal, which is merely a group of conspirators, like what happened in Libya in 1969, or even how Napoleon took over France in 1799. Napoleon was not a member of a revolutionary elite. Mao Zedong, however, was. Just for the record, this guy who stormed the capital last Wednesday was not a member of a revolutionary elite. For these reasons, revolutions usually take a long time to build. 
The climactic moment when crowds rush through the streets or a new flag is hoisted over the Capitol, that happens at the end of the process, not the beginning. Historically, you can argue that Russia's revolution began a century before 1917, as countless revolutionary leaders, thinkers, politicians, and theorists slowly built and refined the political and economic movement that took power after the Tsar was deposed. China, too, was full of revolutionary sentiment for decades before 1911. A very large war, called the Taiping Rebellion, took place in the middle of the 19th century and was one of the many false starts before Sun Yat-sen finally brought off the revolution in 1911. The American Revolution happened fairly quickly by historical standards, but even that began in 1763, almost a decade and a half before the events at Independence Hall that we commemorate on July 4th. Revolutions take generations, not days or hours, and they sure as hell aren't organized on Parlor or 8chan. Another reason why revolutions are long-term and often multi-generational projects is that in order to be successful, they must generally have complex and well-developed ideologies behind them. They must, above all, offer the people of the society a clear and positive alternative to the existing order. In communist revolutions, this has tended to be the promise of economic, in, economic equality. In the American Revolution, it was the promise of liberal representative democracy and economic self-determination. In Iran, it was the, nation, the idea of a nation built on Islamic principles. The thinkers and theorists of the world's great revolutions, Che Guevara in Cuba, Thomas Jefferson in the United States, Mao in China, have in many ways harder jobs than the military commanders who fight to defend revolutionary principles. The French Revolution of 1789 went badly awry in part because it wasn't undergirded by a coherent ideology. The same was true of the Mexican Revolution of 1910. A successful revolution must not only convince the people of a nation to say no to an existing order, but to simultaneously say yes to something else, something that they must be convinced will enrich their lives. The insurrection at the Capitol in January 2021 had none of the hallmarks of a revolution. It was an attempt at a coup, pure and simple. It was about one specific person, that being Donald Trump. And had it been successful, only that person and his immediate family would have benefited. Even the people who tried to pull off this coup would not themselves have benefited from it. This is very, very far from the kind of big societal level program of sweeping change that has usually accompanied the world's great revolutions. Before we leave this subject, I want to talk about one very silly thing that happened seven years ago and which very few people remember today, but which is instructive of how people who don't understand history get revolutions completely and sometimes comically wrong. In May 2014, some activists within the Tea Party movement, which was then beginning to die out, attempted to organize what they thought would be a revolution with a march in Washington, D.C. that they called Operation American Spring. Heavily promoted online, this event promised that they would remove President Barack Obama and several other leaders, including Nancy Pelosi and then Speaker of the House John Boehner, from power and return, quote-unquote, constitutional government. According to the organizers, 10 to 30 million people were expected to turn out for Operation American Spring. It's hard to know exactly how many did turn up on the National Mall in Washington, but the number I kept seeing in my research was 30. Not 30 million, 30. They all went home after an hour or so of stomping around shouting impeach Obama. Twitter in particular mocked the thing for days under the hashtag Operation American Spring. It was a total incompetent failure and a rather amusing one. We can laugh at Operation American Spring, but there was nothing funny about what happened at the Capitol this week. But it does show how people who don't know anything substantive about history can mistake what they see as the trappings of real revolutions and assume that they're relatively straightforward and easy to accomplish. Insurrection and revolution are dangerous, deadly, and extraordinarily complex historical processes. They are not toys for children to play with. Indeed, the travesty that occurred at the Capitol on January 6th is exactly the kind of thing that Thomas Jefferson warned against in the Declaration of Independence, 
an uprising for, quote, light and transient causes. There has never been a successful coup attempt in the United States in its nearly 250-year history, and there have been comparatively few coup attempts. That's not a historical accident. Coups tend to happen in countries where the political and social fabric of the nation is weakened or under severe stress. A robust, well-functioning democracy can easily resist the pressures of extremists or self-interested ideologues. That's the main lesson that history should teach us about what happened on Wednesday. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, share, do all that stuff that you usually do for a video that you like, and I'll be back soon with some more historical thoughts. Thanks.